you're either gonna die or you're gonna win. And you gotta get through that, and it's just super inspiring to see. Well, uh, well a big intention with the film was really to examine aspects of climbing that I find really meaningful. And most of the films around climbing that I see are like doom and gloom or like over dramatized and, um, and didn't really speak to the things that I felt were really powerful for me. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the, the big themes in the film are, are clearly around friendship and, and loyalty and mentorship. And, uh, you know, that's a big part of, of climbing is that mentorship and you have a mentor that kind of, you know, passes down the craft and, but becomes much more than that, you know, because they, they pass down an ethos and a style and, uh, and, you, and you choose your partners carefully and, and your, um, your mentors kind of find you in a way. And so, you know, I'm really obviously uh, grateful for my mentor. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but... <clears throat> yeah. But you had to get back safely, too. What was, what was it like coming down? You must have been tired, hungry. It looked pretty steep going down. How long, did, how long did it take? How hard was it? How dangerous was it? Yeah, so... Um, the the descent is oftentimes the most dangerous part of a, a climb um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you are usually, you know, it's been a long climb and if you've summited, you could potentially put your guard down a little bit. Um, and there's just a lot of opportunities to, to make mistakes, but uh, it took us about two days to get down. And yeah, descents are statistically uh, where most accidents happen on a climb. So you have to be hyper-conscious, like knowing that and going into the descent. And so when you get to the top, you might have heard this before, but it really is only halfway. And it's not until you're back on the ground that you can really kind of relax. Um, and for us, it's like the moment when you, when you get to the ground and you get to like take your harness off and it drops to the ground and it's almost kind of hysterical because you're like looking at your partners and dropping stuff on the ground and being like, ha ah, ha because, you know, for, if you're up on the climb, you can't ever drop anything. Like if you drop a boot or like, you know, everything is really critical. So there's that moment of release when you get to <laughs> drop stuff on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Um, just in the back there, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, how you guys did the, the filming and the, and the imagery is stunning and you guys had guys up close? Was it just the three of you or were, did you have somebody else with you and then how do you get the, the further away images? So tell yeah. us about Well, I mean, I wish I had another crew with me, but um, <laughs> basically Renan and I just handed off a camera between the two of us and uh, we, you know, for a climb like this, you know, you have to carry all of your batteries and you can't really, well, you can't recharge your batteries on the climb or look at dailies or, you know. Um, so you have to shoot really judiciously and be hyper-conscious of what you're, what you're filming, um, you know, if you're, the sequences and all those things, making sure you're shooting a whole scene. But, you know, the, the big challenge with, uh, this kind of shooting is, you know, in the world that I work in, there's there's kind of two types of expeditions. There's the expeditions that are kind of production-based, so oftentimes, like, these big Everest trips, you know, the, the climb is almost based around the production, or it is, in fact, based around the production. Uh, and then there's expeditions where the climbing objective is the main goal. Um, and I prefer this kind of, climbing, um, it's, and, and the shooting on it, it's much more documentary style shooting on the fly. And uh, so we went really light, um, two cameras, 
uh, 12 batteries. I kept one card and one battery for Summit Day if there was going to be one. Um, you have to sleep with the batteries because to keep them warm. I mean, there are all these little minor factors that kind of add up on top of the other stuff. Um, but, you know, there's kind of like one, there's like a couple things, you know, you shoot when you can. Um, don't drop the camera, <laughs> things like that. But, you know, like most documentary films, you shoot tons and tons of footage and then you have to cull it down. And in this film, we probably used 80% of the footage that we shot on the climb because we just didn't have that much footage because um, we were busy climbing. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, why don't we go back there somewhere? Yeah, Jimmy, so uh, this is my second time watching the film, and the, the thing that struck me, what I'd like to hear kind of more personally from you is, after the avalanche, you say you go off the grid, you don't really talk much about that. Um, to the extent that you're, you want to be honest about that, it would be interesting to hear kind of what that journey was like for you. Well, uh, the after the avalanche, um, I basically took off what was interesting about the avalanche actually was that I had so much happening that week and like, it, and I've been building, you know, I have this issue of like not being able to say no. So I had like stacked all of these really significant projects on top of each other. And it was kind of, it's almost like before it happened, I almost knew that something was gonna blow because I was just so stacked on, uh, with obligations and things. So when that happened, you know, I took that as a pretty solid sign. And I actually just went down to Mexico and um, checked out for a while to surf. Um, and surfing's great for me because, you know, I love climbing and skiing, which I do all the time, but there's like a certain level of pressure because I'm paid to do that. And so surfing is this great thing because like I'm, it, I have like no pressure and it's just this thing I really love doing, but you know, I have no obligations to be a professional at it. So I, I went down um, and for a few months and it just took some time to kind of figure out what my priorities were, which actually after the avalanche, I remember this moment of clarity where it, it's like in my normal life, you've got all these different things in your head and you're not sure what to prioritize and right after the avalanche it was like they all just stacked it was like which was really interesting so I kind of and I wrote all those things down and I went down to Mexico and kind of really pondered what was important and then um, but but being in the mountains was still definitely a big priority um, and it's just the place where I you know, have my exchange with my best friends and where I experienced wilderness, which is like really therapeutic for me, but you know, I had to sort out um, the, the negative aspects of that and try to work around that, which took some time. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that uncertainty is at the core of adventure. And it's part of what we really love about climbing. And I'd love to hear about a specific moment of uncertainty for you, because you guys, were, you each had a different role in climbing Meru, but in your specific role, what was the most uncertain moment for you in carrying that responsibility? And what was kind of going through your head as you set off on that, on that lead? Uh, probably making the decision around Renan to go back because here's this guy who's like my really close friend who's like basically begging me to he's like I, I, I really need this I have you know and you're trying to make good decisions for yourself and for your partner and um, you know I just didn't want to jeopardize 
risk his life and really it was risking our our lives too so um, that was really hard I, and we had a lot of pressure from our peer group and our friends who were like what are you guys thinking you know um, and you, you probably heard it when it was going down but um, we just was in the climbing community so it was kind of a hard decision and I felt like I was going against the grain against a lot of my peers even John you know who I talked to all the time was like are you, you know you saw his reaction <laughs> It's like, what are you thinking? Um, but what I decided, and this is the great thing about my partnership with Conrad, is that we've done so many trips together, we don't have to make, like, we don't have to say much to understand what is the other person's thinking. And so I really only had to say, he called me and I was like, Conrad, uh, you know, we, we have to bring Renan. And he was kind of quiet for a minute. And there was an unstated understanding that Basically, we were willing to jeopardize the, the summit to um, just at least be able to go back and share the experience with Renan, go back on the climb. Whether or not we, we summited wasn't, you know, we were basically saying wasn't a priority. And um, so that was a fairly significant moment uh, on, during that period. 